Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. And we are here today at the Oculus Game Days, which is their big gathering of developers to show the press mm -hmm. the launch lineup for the Oculus Rift. Mm -hmm. It's GDC week, we are off site, and this is the Oculus event. Now, Oculus Rift comes out at the end of this month, March 28th, and on that day, Oculus and its partners will release over 30 games. They have the exact list right now. One of the fears we had going in was those games would be a lot of them, or some of them would be ports of Gear VR games. Yeah or maybe old flat screen 2D games just add, with the VR added component in. After all, they were shipping with basically a Gear VR controller, but none of the games we looked at, with the exception of one, even used that controller. That's right, so we got to, we're gonna go play 12, over 12 games. Of the 31, some are gonna be those Gear VR games, but there are a lot of first party development games, things that Oculus Studios has helped bring to fruition, and we're gonna play those games, give you our impressions, and then I'm gonna chat with Nate Mitchell. Oh, I was, you got you got Oculus eyes, Jeremy. I have I've had Oculus face all day. Every, as soon as you take these goggles off, you have red face for about twenty minutes. Now this was your first time using the CB1, the consumer version. That's right. Um, and you've used HD Vive Pre before. Mm -hmm. You have it at the office. Yeah. What did you think about the differences in physical hardware? Well, the last time I used the Pre, it did have a GoPro attached to it. For all yeah. fairness, but CB1 insanely light. As you've said before, but once you feel that, it's definitely the lightest VR headset I've ever tried. And, the weight distribution. And that makes a difference. Right. I mean, you can really wear this thing very comfortably. I was really happy with it. More importantly, the sound was great. I, oh. I mean, you see these little headphones and you think, okay, that kind of looks like, uh, you know, something you might get from Walgreens. Those are nice quality headphones. I was very impressed. I have nice headphones. I will not be using them with these embedded in the uh, in the CB1. I also noticed you have some ginger ale. They're serving ginger ale, which they tell me is good for <laughs> nausea, and it's necessary. There's a few of these games here that induce that kind of thing. Now, we played over a dozen games, and for some of those games, we'll have full videos, full impressions, and interviews with developers. But yep. let's talk, run through some of these games that we played, uh, starting with Smashing the Battle. Now, this is a one developer team uh, from <laughs> team? Korea, yeah. and it's a third-person action game. Yeah. Like, it, you're following a small character running through these environments. It's kind of a combat-y kind of game, yeah. right? It's Hack and slash. Right, like a gauntlet-style game, but futuristic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really demonstrated, like, that type of tabletop, mm -hmm. mini-scale action yeah. game that you can get right. in VR. It's one, of these, it's one of these things where the even third-person games, it just sends home exactly just how much better a third-person game can be. It doesn't have to be a first-person game in order to be VR. Uh, if you have a third-person game, it can look like a giant toy set uh -huh. that, is just, that is surrounding you and that you're immersed in. And it's actually very, very compelling. And the developer actually encouraged us to move around, even though we are play it while sitting. Yeah. He encourages us to stand up and kind of bend forward or approach it from different angles. Mm -hmm. You know, there's tracking on the back of the headset, so you can see the game environments from from different angles. Right, and though they're not holograms, it kind of feel, you get that sense. If you stand up and you get close to them, you kind of feel like yeah. you're just surrounding this three-dimensional hologram. It's pretty. I, li pretty I like the aesthetic of it too. Even though it's a one-person development team, it looked really polished. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Props to him. Now, a game that we are very familiar with and seen many times is Job Simulator. Sure. And Job Simulator we saw here. Uh, uses the Oculus Touch controllers, mm -hmm. the, the prototypes that they have. And this is interesting because Job Simulator is going to be for all the VR platforms. Mm -hmm. It's going to be on PSVR, it's on HEC, Vive, SteamVR, yep. and it's with Oculus Touch. With each of those, they've designed different environments in different ways. The, the, the game assets are laid out differently so you can be forward-facing or 360 environment. Okay, and there's also three different size rooms yes. that you can be in, yeah. and each of those has both forward-facing and 360, is that right? Yeah, so one of the questions I have is about the parity between the three hardware systems, and to talk a little more about that, I chat with Alex from Alchemy Labs about Job Simulator. All right, so I'm here with Alex, of course, from Alchemy Labs, makers of Job Simulator, and you guys are here showing off your game with Oculus Touch. Yes. Um, you guys are developing for all three of the VR platforms with motion controller, HTC Vive, Oculus Touch, and the PlayStation with the, the, uh, the remove controllers. Yep, all um, three. I want to talk about the differences between the systems and how you're making a game that works with the systems. Because yeah. with the Vive, with the light 
the, the lighthouse systems, you can have a bigger tracking area or, yeah. uh, that you can plan for. And here, with the demo you're showing, it's for, mostly forward facing. Um, and you talked at length about the different types of games that you can design with the, with the different scales. Right, yeah. I mean, at Unite um, and at Oculus Connect, we talked all about how we're reconfiguring the game and how we've kind of distilled the hand controllers down to like what, what do they do best, six degree of freedom motion, and also having a trigger. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've made it work across three platforms, and I think multi-platform is really important in the early days of VR. So for the Oculus Touch, what does work best? How much space do you want to design for, and what is the scale of something like the kitchen room? Right, so um, I think you're alluding to the fact that basically for each of our jobs, we hand architecture a new size setup. So we've been making a large version, a medium version, and a small version. Mm -hmm. uh, and each of those has either, you know, is it either 360 or, uh, you know, primarily having most of the interactable objects in the forward half circle uh, for tracking. So uh, it's really not down to platform, it's down to the tracking setup. So if you've got, you know, opposing trackers, you could do 360. If you've got, um, you know, forward facing trackers, which that's the conference setup that they've been, they've been, they've been using to show touch, which you know, I don't know how the consumer finalization will go, but it's, you know, here's where we are. We've got touches that are mounted, you know, in the uh, front. around, you know, in the front, kind of high up and facing toward like a point in the center. Mm -hmm. That means that you've got a good range of motion and we've got, you know, he's playing in the background here. Uh, we've got our, I think it's around eight foot from end to end uh, version of the kitchen, which is like our medium-ish, seven or eight feet. But we haven't locked down like the exact final inches because you know it'll be slightly different per household. Just like someone who may have the vibe, maybe he doesn't have a big play space, they could play in the small area in just front facing with exactly. the Oculus version. If it ends up someone wants to put multiple cameras in opposing corners, you would allow them the option to play in the bigger play space in 360. Yeah, I mean we'll we'll see like what the consumer setups end up being and how that goes. And we're still you know some time away from from that launch, so we're still figuring it out. But the uh, what what you're playing here is like the the rearranged version, which has everything completely accessible uh, on the touch controllers with no tracking loss or any problems like that. So it's been working out great. Now, touch and tracking, you know, with the vibe, the way that those controllers are designed, they're more one-like. You have the, the part of the top, which is those, those donuts, which are yep. what the lighthouse, what sees the lighthouse. Uh, yep. With touch, they're more closer to your hand. Mm -hmm. So what can you do with the touch controllers and how close can you get them? And can you design objects that you have to use two hands to interact with? Yeah, so we've been uh, doing a lot of two-handed interactions in Job Simulator, and when we build something in Job Simulator, we need to make sure that it's working great across all the different hand inputs. So when you've got move controllers, touch controllers, and vibe controllers, it comes down to distilling what is great about the hand input controllers you know, across the board. So really, it's six degrees of freedom motion that you can reach anywhere and do anything and have a single trigger. Uh, we initially had some more buttons that we were going to assign but we realized that we want people to be able to jump in and have a one-button interaction. Mm. And there's so much you could do just with gripping uh, that we said, okay, that's a common across all three. We're going to use that as our core input and uh, go from there. So we've got, you're pulling like a cork out of a wine bottle, which means that one hand's holding it and then you reach the other hand right up next to it within less than an inch and pull a cork out. We've got dials that you're adjusting, you're pouring drink from one drink to the other. Chains that the you're chain, pulling. Uh, in the newly announced right. to come, uh, you know, automotive mechanic, which we're going to announce. Uh, and all those things involve hands getting very close to each other. We've never had any problem on any of the platforms with having, I'm inaccessible to get to the interaction type that I need. The only thing we were mentioning about like, is the plastic ever kind of an issue about right. getting near something was we just want to make sure the floor is calibrated properly so that when you reach down and you want to grab something off of the floor, that people overreach a little and we don't want them smacking into the ground. So if you get that just right and the hands are aligned, everything works out great. Uh, As a developer, is the yeah. idea of occlusion or proximity, which of those you see is a bigger game design issue? Uh, I mean, really, if you've got your tracking set up, set up in a way where you're going to the space, you know, you're working within the space that is afforded by the tracking, we don't have any issues with overlapping or any kind of like, oh, now, Mm -hmm. I'm having troubles doing what I need to do. You just need to be doing it in the right place, and all those two-handed interactions are working great for us. Now, with the gripping action, because that's the parody among all three, all three yeah. controllers have some type of gripping action. Yeah. You can grip with either a trigger or with, on the Vive, the two grip pads, with a touch, that grip trigger. Um, yeah. They're different because on the touch controller you're you're using the the grip action, but on the yeah. Vive controller you're using the trigger. We're actually still experimenting with whether it feels more 
smooth to use the forward triggers on the touch or to use the input, like the inside mm -hmm. triggers, which I guess they're called grips, Yeah. which are confusing because we, we just use whatever terminology has been kind of like legacy. The grip is kind of side and triggers on like what your pointer finger uses. But either way, uh, I think it can work on either. On the, on the Vive controller, it feels definitely clearly is the pointer finger for picking up. On the touch controller, there's kind of been like, okay, should we do it one way or the other? I think we added in a button where you could swap between one to the other just to test like what would be, you know, because it's not coming out yet and we're still working on it, we're still trying to figure out what's the best way, what's the most natural, and what has parity across other touch games. Does Oculus it, provide guidance, for example, like for grip, you know, it's better to use that middle finger grip because that's what most games are going to use, that's what they're training gamers to use? Yeah, we've been talking about that and I think as more touch games start to come out, we'll there'll be some kind of standardization across that because we don't want to be the only game that has a different way of picking things up because right. picking up something is such a, a basic interaction it that be a natural. lot of games, it should be extremely natural. So once there's a you know, standard established, we just go with it. And I think it'll work on either of those. It just If you train yourself one way, it'll feel weird doing the other and you just kind of get used to whatever it is. So just got to go with it. You're coming out on a buy very soon. That hardware is coming out soon, but this is obviously coming out for PSVR and also Oculus. Yeah. Are, is the game going to change at all between now and the later releases? Um, you know, we're laser focused on making sure that we could ship our original, you know, it's it's our flagship game at Alchemy. We want to make sure that when we put it out, uh, it's extremely solid so we can work on porting and making it feel amazing on all platforms. So uh, we'll see what comes after April, but right now it's uh, sleepless nights and, and crazy crunch up until, you know, we ship. Sounds like a life of a VR developer. That's how it goes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, man. Now, one of the games that we played uh, is a game that's been in the kind of development kit pipeline for a long time. Mm -hmm. DK1, DK2 owners have played it. Radio G. Oh my gosh. Yes, so this is a wipeout style, yeah. I want to say, racing game, but it's set on a tube. Huh. So you race down a tube and you can go on all sides of it and it has a terrific sense of motion. You can jump on it. It's one of these games that pushes that uh, motion sensitivity, I think, factor a little bit. There's people who are gonna be sensitive to the motion are probably gonna wanna ask their friends what they think of this game first. Right, the tracks are, they're wild because you're on yeah. like, a, like a cable that you can spin all the way around. So one, you have to actually figure that out. Yep. You can hit these jump gates and speed gates and two of their different speed classes. I think we played the 100cc mm -hmm. speed class, and I spoke, speaking with the developer, I found out the tracks are about 15 miles long, mm -hmm. and the fastest speed you can get is Mach 1. Nice. Which is insane. Yeah, I think certainly there's gonna be gamers out there that go directly for the extreme games. Yeah. This is gonna be one they wanna check out. Now, I didn't feel discomfort. Did you feel discomfort? Yes, I did. Oh, you yes, did? did? Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, there were probably three games of, how many did we see, 13 today? Yeah. Honestly, most of the games I felt completely comfortable in. I think a lot of developers, they're all measuring like, how far do I want to push that? Because there certainly is going to be a market for the more extreme games that, that push that motion sensitivity. Um, this is, just happens to be one of those games. It's a racing game, and it's hard to avoid that. Um, do you remember, was there a sense of a cockpit, or was it? There was a cockpit, yeah. absolutely. And there's a balance between how much cockpit to show. Because right. the more cockpit you show, the more comfortable you are. The yeah, I think so. The more relative at points you are. Um, now, the developer told me that they did something with uh, acceleration. So discomfort is caused in motion by acceleration. Yes. So when you hit a speed gate, they actually fuzz out the screen a little bit, put more different visual cues to distract you from the fact that you're accelerating. That's interesting. They're not yeah. the only developer that's had to take steps to try to alleviate that motion sensitivity. Now, one of the games that has motion, but a different kind of motion, yep. uh, that you are super excited for is Pinball FX. It does have a different kind of motion. Right. Like, you're not moving, but the ball is moving. Well, you can move. It is motion tracked. I mean, and that's what makes this so great is because there have been simulated pinball games forever. I'm a pinball collector. I play in a league. I take it, you know, pretty seriously. I've been waiting for this since the you know introduction of virtual pinball. With this, you can now finally move your head around the world and you can get a track on the ball, you can get a bead on his motion, and I'm telling you, it makes a world of difference. You can play the game so much better. I think for people who are into pinball, this is actually gonna mean a lot because it's, it feels like playing a real pinball machine, which sounds crazy, but it is virtual reality pinball, and it's, it's second only to playing a real game. Now, I've played Pinball Effects. It is a version that exists on 2D desktops. Uh, yeah. but with the Oculus and in VR, you're playing at 90 frames per second. And I think it actually yeah. matters 
at 90 FPS because mm -hmm. you, you see the motion better. The ball is moving pretty fast. Yeah, that actually. game, it's always had this trail behind the ball, but you were commenting that, you know, maybe at 90, you don't even need that trail anymore. You can yeah. just watch it as you would a regular ball in real life. And it's a game that, you know, as VR gets better, I'd want to play it maybe 120 FPS. Sure. It's a perfect pinball simulator, you're hoping. Yeah. Uh, but another type of simulator that we saw was just racing the Sims, mm -hmm. Project Cars. Yeah. This was like, they represented racing since here. I was, I was pretty impressed. And I guess this, this game's been out for a year now in 2D, I mm -hmm. should say, what we call it, the flat, flat screen, screen experience. That's right. um, it's been on Steam, it's, I think it's been pretty successful. They've been on, um, they've been releasing um, Oculus support and people have been discussing it and our Oculus in places, but they kind of stopped development on that, or at least releasing developments on that, and they started, continued to work internally, and they've finished it. And it's, it's actually quite good. All the menus, it's from start to finish, it's a complete VR experience. Um, and I think pe people who were playing it, who thought development kind of stopped, are going to be quite pleased with this. Now, the motion, the HUD in the car is built in. It's a natural HUD. You know, everyone knows how to drive. You know, yeah. there's going to be a speedometer. You know where what things are, things happening. Right. Like the mirrors are exactly where you're expecting them to be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in seeing how racing games can take advantage of these things now. Now that it's easy for you to look at both the left and the right mirror, does that affect? racing in, right. in the long run. Yeah, I was, I was curious about the same thing. In fact, with all of the multiplayer games, and this is a, one of them, yeah. um, I was asking the developers, have you seen any metrics on whether or not VR has an impact on mm -hmm. people's success rate and the, their ability to play? And they said, beyond the shadow of it out, when as soon as good players put on VR, they become even better. And it mm. becomes an advantage to play in VR. Um, and there's no question about it. And your sense of speed is well represented in that first person view when you're sitting. Like when I play a racing game, yeah. I like to play from the third person view because right. I see the car, I see the turns coming up, and it's not moving super fast. Yeah. But when I play in the first person on a 2D monitor, it's difficult actually. Well, especially with arcade, with I'm sorry, with uh, simi uh, racing games yeah. like Project Cars, and this is very much a simulation. It's not an arcade racer where you get a fake sense of speed. It's very much you know physics and everything is supposed to reflect reality. And on a 2D, on a flat screen, like you're saying, I don't usually, I don't always get a sense of how fast I'm going. I always smash into walls. I have, you know, I don't have a sense of when, when I should start braking. In VR, I would say that was, I still have a learning curve. But it's less so. It actually felt more in touch with the reality of the game. I was crashing into all sorts of walls, yeah. and a damage model was great in that <laughs> yeah. mirror field, in the in, in the cockpit of the car. Yeah. But what I also heard from the developer is that to keep that 90 FPS, they can actually turn down the level of detail in the distance because of the okay. screens in the game. Like if I'm playing a racing game in 4K on my on a flat desk screen. I want everything in the far distance to be super highly detailed. Yeah. But in VR, the near field actually matters more. Right, so absolutely. That, that was interesting. Um, and then we played a game that was completely t a step back. It wasn't first person, it was defense grid, a tower defense game. Right, yes. Um, so that was, that was another one like the first game that we played, which was like having a toy set in front of you. Yeah. And what was interesting about this one is you could teleport around the game. So you're, you're a god, and you're placing your defense towers around, and you're watching the little toys come out. But then, sort of like in Homeworld, where if you alt-click into one of your spaceships, you go there and you can see like the space battle happening around you. You can do that in this defense grid game, where you you you, um, you tap one of the buttons and you go and you become a tower. And you, you're not forced to move, so there's no motion sickness involved. Mm -hmm. It's actually a very comfortable game. It's one of the most comfortable I've, that we played today. But you can then really see the detail that they had to add to this game. Now, jumping into one of the control towers is the only way to switch your camera view. Um, right. But if the game actually designs to have one fixed camera, overarching camera view, pulled back. Now, this is a port of a, of a flat screen game, right. so they have to choose a camera view so you can actually see the entire map. Yep. So you can see the beginning where the, the minions come out, you can see what you're trying to defend, yeah. and then you can jump in and teleport. But because you can now get in that close, I said, ah. how many assets did you have to update? All of them. <laughs> and interesting enough, it's a game that you can actually play with the Oculus remote, because it's very simple. You're just controlling right. with your eye gaze, very quickly, faster than they say with a mouse. You just look at a point, look at a point, activate, and you know d deploy a turret. Yeah. And all you need is a remote to do that. You mm -hmm. don't even need a gamepad. Mm -hmm. So I think this might actually be a really easy game for new players to get into. Yeah, and as a defense t uh, tower defense kind of game, I thought it was it was pretty successful. I mean, you can very clearly tell what level all the units are, and it was it was a lot of fun to play. Yeah, and ha and comfort, super comfortable. Super comfortable because it was that overarching view, and they never moved the camera. Yep. Now, a game that you found surprisingly comfortable and engaging mm -hmm. was The Climb. Dude, 
Yes, I did not expect to feel very comfortable in that game because it does force movement on the player. So this is the um, Crytek game where mm -hmm. you um, climb a mountain and they unveiled the Alps today, which was a, a new environment, I believe. And um, you clasp your hands onto the mountain. Now, but you're doing that with your hands and yep. you would imagine they would be use, using Oculus Touch controls. Exactly. But it's not, it's the gamepad. That's right. And I, I so you, you gaze where you want it to go and then you pull yeah. the triggers and you have, you know, if you hold too long with just one hand, you run out of stamina, you have to hold with both hands to, you know, reclaim that, chalk up your hands. There's a lot of like timing and strategy involved. But the, the scariest part is the jumping aspect. So right, if you can't reach to the ledge, you have to look at where you want to go, jump with the A button, and then grab once you land there. And that jumping movement is not natural. Like, I did not move through space there. Right. But strangely, it did not make me motion sick at all. Mm. So there's definitely something interesting happening in there. And one of the things we took away from this event is mental load. How much does the developer want to put on your brain for you to have to focus on when you're playing games? Yeah. Here, you're focusing on where to place your hands, how much shock is your hands, the stamina meter, and with all the cues, like the heartbeat and the sweat, it was, I think it was just the right amount. Yeah, and of all the games I played today, that was the only one that caused me to sweat physically. Like I, the, actually, you didn't need the visual cue. No, I didn't. No, looking down, you're like you're on a mountain, and you're looking up, and it there's countdowns, and I was nervous. It was a really a compelling visceral. experience. It was visceral. I liked it. Another visceral experience. Yeah. We played VR Sports Challenge. When you, when you tell me sports in VR, you think, okay, am I going to throw a ball? And yeah, you actually throw the ball, yeah. and you catch the ball. You play football, we play basketball, mm -hmm. trying to make those three-point shots. Mm -hmm. um, you got the highest score of the day, my ah, friend. I did, in, in football. Well, I chatted with uh, Teen, one of the developers of VR Sports Challenge, to talk about their game design. So mm -hmm. check that out. So I'm here with Teen, uh, who's working on VR Sports Challenge. Sports games for VR, using the Oculus Touch. Uh, can you tell me how many games are in here? And yeah. What they are? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's a natural. I mean, the touch controllers unlock a whole new world, and uh, you are an elite sports athlete. We have basketball. We have baseball. We have football. We have hockey. In basketball. You're the shooter. You're the passer. You're the dunker. Baseball. You're the uh, batter and the fielder. Uh, football. You're the quarterback and the receiver. And in hockey, you're the goalie, and you're on a breakaway trying to score a slap shot. And it seems like there's a mix of like these highlight reel style, um, yeah. awesome yeah. moments in sports that you're doing, combined with full games. Like for example, in the football yeah. uh, semi played, I was both. You're both the quarterback and the receiver. You throw to yourself essentially, yeah. and how well you throw is where the ball is, where at the catch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So can you talk about designing that throw mechanic and, sure. and how to make that comfortable for VR, but so people can have fun, but also don't just lose the controller. Sure, yeah, uh, we're, we, we're calling our, you know, our moments the highlight reel. You're, you're the highlight reel hero. So one thing that we don't want you to do or have to do is force you to play a game in a specific way. So with the throw, for example, we're trying to be as open as possible to any sort of forward momentum. Mm. But um, with football in particular, you throw to where you're looking. So. Uh, that's the abstraction we're making for football, but we want it to feel natural. We want you to just go through the motion. Um, in basketball, it's another type of throw, but again, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible, but also dial you into the mechanic. So if you can throw a straight line towards the basket right. with a good enough arc and a good speed on your release, you're going to get it in. You can do it however you want, though. You can do a granny shot. You can do a sidearm shot. You can do an overhead shot, however. So that's interesting. In football, you're letting the head position mm -hmm. to note the accuracy That's correct. and less so the release motion. There needs to be a motion and release. There's a trigger. motion and release, but um, uh, why I say it's an abstraction is because in, in real life, when you're throwing to somebody that's moving, you're looking at the person that's moving, but your arm is throwing to where they're going to be. Right. We tried, we, we went through a whole development process on how to get to this throw, and this is what we've settled on because it is... It is the way that provides you the most feedback of like, why did I miss? Why did I not miss? Mm. Because I was looking there, because I wasn't looking there. So, and it gives you the most control. So. Whereas in basketball, you have no target at all. It's yeah. the hoop, and you don't. Know, you're it's actually at the practice yeah. and aim it straight. Now, how much tweaking and balancing do you have to put there so that it's the right motion? Because you're not holding a basketball; you're holding touch control. Yeah, um, it's a lot, and I think you know, um, watching people play, you you get the hang of it. If you're off to the left, you know, okay, next time I'm going to throw a little bit more straight. Or if you're, uh, 
if your shot is too much of a line drive, you know, okay, I'm going to let go earlier to get more arc on it. Like, the, the results are very, very, you know, you see results in VR and you're adjusting yourself physically, which is something that's, you know, so exciting about working in VR is mm -hmm. you, we're, you're doing true physical input. You in know? both those games, I played this basketball and football mm -hmm. have hand presence. You see your mm -hmm. hands oh, represented. Yeah. I love that in the football, you see a hologram yeah. for your plays, and it made that very intuitive to pick the plays yeah. to actually. So, what, how deep does this game go? Oh, this game goes really deep. Like, um, yeah, you know, each sport has a main game where you're playing a tr you know traditional mm. sports like five on five basketball or you know full hockey. Full hockey. Uh, well, you're actually a man down in hockey, but. Uh, uh, and then we have all these challenge modes that we call them where we take a mechanic or a couple mechanics of the game and we challenge you in them. So you played the three-point contest and the dunk contest. We're challenging you in those modes. Each one of the sports will have that. Deeper metagame, everything you do in the game, you earn you know, an arcade-style uh, yep. score for it. We take that score and we turn it into fans. So you're taking, at the beginning of the game, you're taking control of a franchise, a fictional franchise. The narwhals, the burritos, all these great sports team names that don't really exist in real life, but they exist in our game. And you're trying to build a fan base across all four sports because you're you're the same team in all four sports. Uh, the more fans you get, the higher you progress in difficulty levels across each sport. With each difficulty level, you unlock more features. You unlock mini games. Uh, then the more fans you get, uh, you might unlock some sponsors. And it just goes deeper and deeper. Oh, and then um, the more fans you have also, the, the bigger the stadium is filled. So right. when you're first playing, you're playing in front of just a couple of fans, but you want to get to that point where the stadium is full. So VR Sports Challenge, it's a single player game. Have you guys experimented with multiplayer and cooperative? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's sports. So how can you not experiment in multiplayer? Uh, but I think for, because we're a touch release game, we're focused on getting out the best quality product. Um, uh, you know, we have nothing to say about essentially anything to do with uh, multiplayer right now, but I would say it's definitely a natural fit. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Norm. The, one of the final games we played today was Damage Core. Yeah, where are all the first-person shooters? That's right. Here and it is. Here's a first-person shooter that you actually play with the gamepad yeah. standing up. I didn't expect that. Right. Um, it was fun. It was fun. So let me explain the mechanic. Yep. You know, you're, it's, you're aiming with your head pressing the trigger button to fire, but you teleport between enemy units. Yeah, you become an enemy, and then right. once you become an enemy, you, they don't move anymore, and you can't move. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. physically move, right. but you can still dodge and look around and oh, turn you look, around. You have to look around in all directions. Yeah. And so there's a situational awareness that mm -hmm. I needed in the game. It was, I think, one of the few games I played today where by the end of it, I completely forgot where I was, what direction I was facing. Totally. But I was immersed. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a great mix of intensity, which we got from a lot of games that cause motion sickness without the motion sickness. Um, so that I've, I think, and they actually got the rating that is the green circle, which it's a very intense game. So I think that that's, they hit a sweet spot there uh, for that kind of intensity without inducing nausea. One mechanic they had in here that people thought couldn't be done in VR well was the scope. Having a scope. And it, that was interesting, yeah. Yeah, and the scope isn't like uh, where you would pick up a rifle and look down the scope. It actually yeah. just warps in front of you. Right. Um, so you can be aiming at an enemy and press the scope button, and you, it would be magnified right. immediately. Mm -hmm. And that added, it was very comfortable. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, in a, if you're playing a shooting game like Counter Strike, a lot of professional players change your rate, the mouse rate, between fast motion and zoom and scope motion. Right. And they had to change the rate of your head tracking between normal motion and scope oh, motion also. wow, I didn't even think about that. So when you're scoped in, you, ha you can actually be more It's precise. a finer detail. It's a finer level huh. of detail. And they did it in a way that felt natural because you didn't even notice it. Yeah. And it felt perfectly comfortable. Yeah. And while it was still rewarding you if you were accurate without the scope. Yeah. So every, enjoy that. Every weapon has two different modes of fire. You got the primary and the secondary. Uh, I was able to jump into a larger mech at one point, which was super cool. Um, so I, it scale changes as yeah, well. Yeah, I had to take out his two you know, defensive mechanisms, and then I could jump into him. And then I had uh, a bomb that I could lob out and then destroy with an area effect. You know, we'd seen shooting games like Bullet Train, the one that Epic, the demo, yeah. right? And that one has a teleportation mechanic also. But mm -hmm. that had teleportation not with the real purpose. You are just kind of arbitrarily yeah. Moving between well, this nodes. one you have to teleport because that you teleport when you're about to die. Right. So as your health starts to, to you know to wither, you have to jump into another bad guy. And totally immersive that way. Yeah, yeah, and it, the, the graphics are quite good. The Unreal Engine Four, um, and when you're up close to some of those bad guys, I mean you're there. There's a robot in front of you, and you're having a firefight with it, and it's awesome. 
awesome. The whole day was awesome. Yeah. We actually have a lot more demos that we played. We have interviews with uh, developers of Kronos, Adrift, and got to play test Dead and Buried, Oculus's studios, their own first party shooting game. Mm -hmm. So check out those videos, but stay tuned because I'm going to chat with Nate Mitchell, Oculus's VP of product, and talk about the whole launch. All right, so I'm super excited to be chatting with Nate Mitchell, VP of product at Oculus. I think the last time I saw you was at Connect 2. Yeah. And here we are, uh, just a few weeks away from shipping to consumers. Yeah. Wow, it's been a long journey since I think we first met Oculus at CES, like 2013 a or so. A long time ago, yeah. Yeah, and it's been an incredible journey. And viewers out there have followed us through the progression from yeah. the of DK1, DK2, all these technical improvements. You guys are obviously focusing on, focusing on games and the content for the launch lineup. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the hardware and what people are getting. Absolutely. Uh, so Oculus, the hardware has been locked down for a while. The yep. tracking system, you guys are using the Constellation tracking system. You're launching with an Xbox One controller, and a lot of the games here being shown are made to introduce people to VR, right? So what's the yep. thinking behind um, games that you guys are pushing that use gamepad and things that are going to use touch later on? Um, so for us, I think there's this huge set of content that's out there right now already, um, already to go on this built around gamepad. And I think that that's really a result of launching DK1 and DK2 early days when people, developers, really didn't have access to motion controllers. And so what you're seeing here today and what we're really excited to share is, you know, we've got these 30 titles that are all launch titles, fully featured games that have been in development over the last, you know, three and a half years, give or take. Um, and uh, we're just really excited to have that, bring that to market, uh, you know, just in the next few weeks and have everyone be able to dive into these experiences. A mix of everything from, you know, single player experiences that have been classics like Lucky's Tale to some uh, very interesting and exciting multiplayer games. Uh, we were just talking about, you know, yeah. competing in Radial G and things like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to go back to your question, you know, Touch is going to come later this year. There's going to be a whole new set of experiences built around Touch, you know, really unlocks this different sort of natural, intuitive interaction. Um, there's also going to be, and we haven't, you know, shown much uh, here, but there's also going to be a set of experiences built around the Oculus Remote. And we're actually seeing a lot of these uh, simpler uh, games and interactions, or even sometimes video experiences, things like, you know, you've seen Story Studio Lost, you've seen Story Studio Henry, um, experiences like that built around the remote, which just make it really easy for people to put on the headset and really enjoy VR. You know, it, when the VR market really blows up this year, uh, a lot of people in the community are really enthusiastic about you know, room scale VR, track controllers, and stuff yeah. like that. And you guys have a whole range. You know, there's going to be stuff like Job Simulator where you're going to be standing up and interacting mm -hmm. with the room and, and shooting games. Um, what is your approach to, because you're not jumping all the way in with room scale, obviously, with game pads. Is it a, mostly a comfort thing and easing people in the VR? But what's the thinking behind not going all the way in? I think for us, the big goal with Rift is really just to make this um, very flexible for developers, make it really easy for them to develop any sort of experience and then make it really easy for users to get set up to get in and really enjoy themselves. And so we've really focused on making it very simple, very intuitive, um, everything from the hardware, the packaging, the setup process, and then into the content with things like Oculus Home and everything else to really just seamlessly move from experience to experience. Um, I think developers are already making all sorts of different types of experiences from standing to mm -hmm. sitting. Um, there are even some, you know, that <laughs> some developers building like sitting on the floor, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, another sort of uh, whole different experience. And I think that uh, with Rift, you'll be able to sort of do all of these different things. Um, we're not set up uh, for really walking a fair distance and sort of protecting you from going into a wall or something like that. We're really focused on sort of the standing 360 space where you can sort of move about um, with freedom. So I want to like reassure people out there because, you know, if people are making purchasing decisions today and they're buying, you know, pre-ordering Rift, yeah. they're hoping to buy, they, they got to buy a Touch when that comes out because it enhances so much that there's going to be some parity in terms of what you can do and you can't do between the other systems. There, there will be cross-platform experiences. That there, I think there will be cross-platform experiences. That's really up to the developer. Um, I think that right now the, the platforms are similar in a lot of ways. They also have some differences. I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Um, you know, I think games, the best experiences are oftentimes built around a specific input device. And VR is sort of 
uh, not only an input device, but an entire system. So between um, sort of the differences between the platforms, the headsets, those things as they stand today, and then the different inputs, there is gonna be some incompatibility or things that don't feel as good. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we'll see a lot of developers bring content to both, and then obviously we're gonna have a lot of content that we're actually uh, funding and building internally that we're really excited to uh, bring with Touch, like Dead and Buried. Yeah, and that Dead and Buried is a perfect example. Even like Toy Box, it really accentuates not just the positional tracking of controllers and that hand presence, but what you're doing with the Oculus Touch controllers in terms of how it tracks the location of your fingers, and the idea of abstracting your finger movement also. Completely. And so is that something you're going to be pushing forward um, so that those games take advantage of that as touch comes to market? So I think the answer is yes. We try not to you know, force anything on developers. We really want developers to have the freedom to make any choice you know, they want about the experience they're, they're developing. So some of them may support some of those interactions. We definitely hope to see a lot of them do that, especially for social. I think it makes a huge difference. Um, there'll be some developers who don't, and that's absolutely fine too. Again, it's really about giving developers freedom and just building a, a really high quality product that works excited about in terms of the experiences it unlocks. Now you mentioned social and Oculus yeah. is a system I'm gonna have it set up in my office and I'm playing from my computer but VR being social isn't just about interacting with people in the, the metaverse in multiplayer but also people in the real world environment. Yeah. So are you thinking about that places where Oculus can be have a place in the living room where people can have asymmetrical experiences? So the short answer is yes we are thinking about it. The longer answer is that it's not perfect just yet. Um, you know, what we have uh, developed basically with sort of the rec spec machine and the Rift, you know, it's it's it works in the living room. You can set it up there. You can actually, you know, a lot of our sort of internal folks have it set up, I think, in their living room at home. Um, but in terms of asymmetrical experiences, that's still a tough one because you need some input device for other people or they need their own systems to be sort of playing, you know, two Rift setups in one space. Those are things that um, they definitely work, but it's definitely not something that we're sort of actively pushing or investing a lot of resources into making uh, better um, because we do think that's a bit of an edge case for right now. So this is something we want to invest in over time and it really is going to depend on what we see from developers. I think developers, as they come to us, they're like, hey, I'm trying to build like this asymmetrical game. Here's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Um, we'll get better signal on sort of what is the best way to push some of those things forward. I think I love asymmetrical games personally. I love just social uh, multiplayer experiences, especially in VR. And so getting that right over the long term is really important. Right now, though, the honest focus is, you know, one person dropping into VR and then experiencing social with other people in virtual reality. And even if it's one person in VR, they can be potentially broadcasting to their okay. followers online. Are you guys doing things to support YouTube streamers, Twitch streamers, so they can translate their VR experience? Because that's going to be important. So absolutely. I think for us, we uh, again, I wish it's an area we were doing more. I'm a huge Twitch fan. I uh, watch Twitch very frequently. I think... What we've done is basically made it really easy for people to capture what they're seeing in VR. We've worked with developers to make that really easy. Um, and then you can very easily take that, broadcast that to Twitch, and then layer in you know, yourself with a camera so people can really see what's going on. So like an unwarped image on your desktop you can capture with OBS, that kind of stuff. Exactly, and that's been a big focus. Ultimately, honest, honestly, that is up to the developer. They need to make sure that they're rendering everything uh, properly. Mm. But we've pushed, uh, pushed that really hard that you know, for the best experience, a lot of times when I'm playing in VR, are, you're over at my house, you're looking over my shoulder, yep. you want to see what I'm doing. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, almost all the Oculus experiences show some sort of second monitor that people can uh, take a That's That can be on. step one to, to demo it for your family for that Thanksgiving, you know, shared experience. Completely, completely. Now, for connecting with people when they're in games, because they are yeah. multiplayer experiences, one of the foundations of that is your friends list, is Oculus Home. What's the state of that? What are you going to be able to do in VR when you're not playing games? So, Oculus Home. Um, we brought it out on Gear VR originally, you know, very uh, sort of simple, intuitive interface, really designed to get you discovering new content, uh, installing new things, all without leaving VR. And then most important, being able to move between experiences really seamlessly, right? So you're in the headset, you're like, hey, I'm done playing Lucky's Tale, I want to jump over, I want to play some Elite. And we want you to be able to do that without ever leaving the headset. So um, we're going to be launching an all new version of Oculus Home, built from the same foundation, but uh, you know, taking a lot of learnings from Gear and really overhauling the user interface, the environment. Um, Any customization? Are you allowing people to make it their own? So, some of those things may be coming down the road. Right now, we've really focused on uh, simplicity and ease of use and really uh, the store experience, the store and the library to mm -hmm. make those great. I think the other thing we've been looking at a lot, and you know, you sort of led with this, was social. We want you to be able to drop into Oculus Home. You, you, when you put on the headset, you drop right into Home. 
and we have you know all your friends list on the right. So you can kind of quickly glance over, see what people are doing. You might see I'm playing Valkyrie, mm -hmm. um, and then we can really quickly connect through the Oculus platform um, and meet up and fly some space. What about doing things that aren't necessarily VR focused, whether it's watching a video, browsing the web, or playing even existing <coughs> 2D games? So a lot of that stuff, um, and we've talked about some of it before, is really coming outside of Oculus Home in our sort of first party application. So you've got Oculus Video. You know, we have that on Gear Today. Um, some incredible uh, video experiences, 360 video experiences, also connected to Facebook 360, mm -hmm. which makes for um, some pretty exciting uh, content on a weekly basis. Um, we have Oculus Photos, sort of a really great panorama app, also has the Otoy things there. And we ha are going to have a lot of experiences, I think, like that from the community as well. Sort of or your bringing partners, like Samsung making their own web browser yep. you can use. And I was about to say also uh, Microsoft with the Xbox streaming experience, that's something that we're going to be bringing, uh, or Microsoft is going to be bringing to the platform in the next um, few months. And so, again, there's going to be a lot, I think, to do with the device outside just games, and we're really excited about that. So Nate, uh, Brendan talked about success, uh, potential success of Oculus. Wanting to get yes. you know, one million unit ship would be great. And is that a more about talking about demand or supply? Is that I think it's really about um, users in the ecosystem, and I think it's about uh, making developers really successful. I think you know if you and I are developing a game, the main thing that we want is really to get our game out to people and to obviously make enough revenue such that we can reinvest in the business and like you know reinvest in the game and build new games and experiences and. Um, the more users that are out there sort of in buying and enjoying uh, content, the better it is for the ecosystem. And so for us, you know, getting to a million users, that feels like a uh, good baseline for where you know, developers can really start to be very successful. They can be confident in their investment. Yeah, exactly. And that's so important because you know, if you're out there and you want people creating great VR content, the most important thing you can do is buy a VR headset and buy content because that really gives, you know, it it's all goes back into the ecosystem of making more games. What do you feel like are the barriers to that? Is it awareness? Is it computers, the cost of PCs? There are a lot of barriers. <laughs> I think right now it depends on which side you look at. I think on uh, with Oculus Mobile and Gear VR, we have a very low barrier to entry. I think mm -hmm. you know Samsung actually bundling Gear VR with the S7, super exciting in terms of the influx of, of people getting to try VR for the first time at incredibly low barrier to entry. You know, because they've already bought the headset, yep. or I'm sorry, they've already bought the phone, and they're sort of feeling excited about that. On the on the Rift side, definitely, this is a more expensive product. There's a barrier to entry in terms of the, the rec spec machine um, powering the experience. That's all going to get you know more cheaper over time. Um, that's probably the, the greatest barrier to entry. I think the other thing that's going to draw people in is content. You know, ultimately, if there's not an experience that you are really excited about and really fired up about, you're probably not going to opt to dive into either you know Gear VR or Rift. And so, uh, getting more developers, getting more experiences out there that attract all sorts of different types of people, that's really going to help grow the uh, grow the user base. Do you foresee the generations of Rift come? Because you guys are obviously forward looking and thinking about down the line. Is it more going to be like cell phones where cell phones get maybe updated every two years or so, but they're functionally the same, or console generations <laughs> where you're going to get a second console? This is a great question. So we don't have too much to say on the topic right now. Um, what I will say is I think VR is going to move really, really rapidly. And one of the things that we're focused on is uh, what are the key innovations that can happen in the near term um, and what do we want to do about them uh, on Rift, on mobile. Um, look, if you look back to where we were three and a half years ago, I think you and I would guess differently about where we'd yeah, be today. Absolutely. Three and a half years from now, it's going to be a whole different uh, world. It's a whole different ecosystem. Expectations were exceeded, so hopefully that pays forward. So um, I think we're excited about a lot of the advancements that are coming down the line sort of in the industry and uh, we'll have more to share in the next you know couple years. And then finally what games are you playing? What are the things you go back to every day? So I've been playing a lot of uh, Valkyrie honestly. I've been playing um, some of the unannounced games uh, that have multiplayer support. We've been playing a lot of those at the office. That's not very uh, juicy but that is the truth. Um, a lot of uh, God, I've been playing a lot of the multiplayer games. I've been playing some of the Climb recently, which I've been really enjoying. Um, and then Dead and Buried has been a huge favorite around the office. Um, we've had a, a few sort of heated competitions, Dead and Buried competitions mm -hmm. between Palmer, Brendan, and others. Um, and so that's been a big fun one. Awesome. Definitely is a testament to how important social and multiplayer is. Multi yeah, it's, for me, that's the thing. I'm such a multiplayer uh, gamer in general. And so for me, when I jump in to sort of mess around in dog food, I love to grab a couple of the people next to me and be like, hey, let's jump in there together and actually maybe get a little competition going. Um, it's just a lot of fun. I'll have to grab your username after when a game launches. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nate. Yeah, Norm. It's Always great, great chatting to see with you. you. Yeah. Congratulations on the impending launch. Uh, thank you.